find your own Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews chapter uh, 5. Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to read uh, from verse 11 to 6, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 6, verse 3. About this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracle, oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, and of instructions about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Heavenly Father, we do ask you today to illuminate and strengthen us by the power of your word. We pray, Father, today as we look at, at this issue of doubting, this issue of drifting, excuse me, in, in, in this, this time, I pray, Father, that you would help us deal with drifting in our life. Help us, Lord, to be the people that you want us to be at this time in, the, in your way. Father, we ask that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Actually, I put my title slide as incorrect. <laughs> so, anyway. So I want to introduce to you a friend of mine. We're going to deal with four friends. I was getting them mixed up, but uh, it will be okay. Drifting, defiant, doubting, and disciple. And you may find as you go along in this series in a little bit that you identify with one or many of those actions in your life. They're really characters that I'm going to describe. And so and in each case, we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what God has to say to these characters and therefore to us from Scripture. Now I'm going to introduce to you drifting. I'm going to introduce you to drifting. And let me tell you, drifting then thinks of himself as a good person. A good person. Uh, and in many ways, he is. He is like so many of us, kind and thoughtful, considerate, always interested in other people. Over the years, he sort of drifted in and out of the church. Growing up, he liked the pastor. And very often, he... He said things that made him think that he, uh, the pastor said things to make him think, but he was really never settled in what he believed. There was something that wasn't, made him not fully engaged. At college, drifting met some new friends and began to explore new ideas. Over time, his questions about Christianity increased. He questioned, is there really a God? He would think to himself. And he would also say, and if there is, why doesn't he do something about the suffering and starving children of the world? He continued to question and question things. Drifting would come back home during Christmas and summer break. And his pastor would always be interested in how he was doing and what he was learning. My friend thought that maybe he should ask the pastor these questions that have been going through his mind. But then drifting, being thoughtful and considerate and kind, didn't want to ask the pastor the questions for fear of embarrassing him or maybe the questions were a little bit too difficult to answer. Maybe there was really no answer. So over time what happened is that my friend Drifting became convinced that Christianity was for those that really had a basic need and that he decided that it was not for him. He came to see his life as a journey, a journey where he was always trying to find something new. Remember, 
Drifting is not settled. He's, he's constantly moving back and forth, trying to find something new, something different. We all tend to drift. And I, I'll tell you this, churches drift, people drift. We drift from what we used to believe. And sometimes we have to come back and find out what, were, what was the apostolic faith? What was the faith that I originally believed? But drifting looks for things that are new. He's not quite convinced that he's found it. In fact, he, he knows he hasn't found what he's looking for. He likes to talk about faith a lot. It's not that drifting doesn't like to talk about faith and doesn't have a certain set of beliefs, but those beliefs are not settled. They're not stable. And so that's why I'm calling him drifting. And maybe there's a little bit this morning that you'll recognize in your life. Maybe you recognize that maybe you've been drifting. Maybe during this time, during the coronavirus, during COVID-19, during all that has gone on, maybe your spiritual life is in a drifting mode. Maybe you're just drifting through time. You know, you may, you may have professed faith. Your family may think you're a Christian, but you don't have that same joy that other Christians have. You don't have that same fortitude or conviction. And you don't really know why, and many times you don't care. So let me give you a summary, a summary of this profile of a person named Drifting. Uh, the first, first of four characters we're going to look at in different messages. Uh, drifting is a good person. He's not a bad person. He doesn't do things that you would consider him, oh, I can't believe he's doing this. I can't believe he's... He's doing these type of things. No, he's a good person. He, he, from the outward experience, he seems to be very good. But he doesn't have clear convictions. He has some conviction. He believes some things, and maybe some of the things that he was taught growing up, he believes still. But he's still searching. He doesn't have clear convictions. And also, this person is unsettled because He's searching for something he believes that is new, but hasn't found it. A lot of times that's a problem because in the Bible, there's an old saying, whatever is, is, is true is not new. I mean, really, if you think about it, things that have happened over time, we look back in church history, we look back in history, and we find the same problems that are, we are going through today have been gone through by other believers over the time of the decades and over the centuries. In other words, people have struggled with the same struggles that each one of you are struggling with today. Every one of us is struggling with something in our lives. And we're not alone in that. Now, most of you will know someone, probably who at one time professed faith in Christ Jesus, and has wandered away from that faith. At one time, they were very enthusiastic, maybe during their time of youth. Maybe, maybe when they first came to the church, they were excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. But all of a sudden now, they have wandered away from that faith. They've wandered away from doing what they know they should be doing. The book of Hebrews makes it especially clear in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. It says this. It says, For we have come to share in Christ... How do you know you've come to share in Christ? Look what it says. If indeed, what? We hold to our original confidence firm to the end. I've highlighted those verses. If we, we, we have that settled faith, if we hold that original confidence. And so today we want to look at uh, some different things. Uh, we want to realize that, um, we want to ask the question, what is the position of a, or a spiritual position of a person who once at one point in their life makes a profession of faith and then drifts away and denies the faith that they once professed. What is their spiritual condition or what is their position in Christ? See, what I've called this series is built to last because I believe faith is built to last. I believe that the first thing we see that our faith is the only kind of faith that's worth having, I believe today, is a faith that lasts. Because a faith that doesn't laugh is truly not saving faith at all, at all is it? It comes, it goes. In fact, it, it uses Christianity as a, um, what I would call a, a crutch at times when they need it, but then they're going to jettison it when they don't need it. 
And that's not the way to look at what Christ has to say. In fact, when we celebrated the resurrection about a little over a month ago, we celebrated the resurrection and Easter and everything because we believed that there was something true and substantial and essential about the resurrection of Christ, didn't we? We say those things are, give, give foundations to our faith. But again, he says in that verse, he says, it says, for we have come to share in Christ. Again, you share in Christ if, it says, indeed we hold to our original confidence in him. My question today, do you have confidence in Christ? Are you confident that no matter what is going on in your life, that Christ will be able to be, take care of you today and tomorrow and the next day and the days that are after that? In other words, the evidence, let me just say this, that a person has true faith, and belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ is that, and they share in Christ, is the evidence that a person is in Christ is that their faith lasts. Genuine faith endures, I believe, to the end. It's a distinguishing mark that it perseveres. Faith that does not last very long simply is not saving faith. And you have that clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Look at that verse with me. It says, Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. In other words, this gospel has an effect of saving people. And then it says, If you hold fast, to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So let me say this. No one is saved today or any day by having a passive interest in the gospel. Just, just a glancing interest in the gospel. You are saved if you hold fast to the word that is preached to you. To the word that you read. Now, there's a phrase that is often used among Christians, and I agree with the phrase, but the, that phrase can be misused. It's a great phrase, I think, but it, it contains a wonderful truth, but it also contains a dangerous error. You've probably heard of it. It's called once saved, what? Always saved. Let me tell you, it's a wonderful truth that phrase. The wonderful truth is that Jesus Christ guards and keeps his own. Look at John chapter 10 verses 27 and 28 in your Bibles. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they will follow me. I give them eternal life and here it is. And they will what? Never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Oh, that's a glorious truth, isn't it? I mean, right there, Jesus tells his followers that when you believe in him, that you have, if you're a sheep and you hear his voice and you follow him, you have eternal life. And that eternal life is forever and ever and ever because Jesus will not let go of you. He will make sure that you're stable and you're walking. I mean, that's just a great moment to realize that when you know that you know that you know that when you die, you're going to heaven. That's a great, great confidence, isn't it? It's a wonderful confidence. You say, they'll never perish. Jesus says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. It's marvelous. It's a wonderful thing to think about. But then is, that raises the question, who then are Christ's sheep? And I think the verse answers that. It says, he says, those who, what, hear his voice and follows me, or Jesus. So as Christ's sheep hears Jesus' voice, they follow Jesus. Jesus says he gives them eternal life, and guess what? That eternal life will never cease. You'll have it forever because no one will snatch you out of his hand. Now that brings us to the dangerous error that is concealed within the popular phrase. It is the idea that anyone who at any time and in any way has made a profession of faith will be saved, even if they no longer hold to the word and no longer follow him. 
You see, it's dangerous because it encourages people to hold in their minds the idea that everything is okay, even if I allow myself to drift. God says in Hebrews chapter 2, look what it says. He says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, least we what? Drift away. And then in verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 2, it, it says, then how shall we neglect so great a salvation? So these verses we're looking at in Hebrews and in chapter 5 were written to challenge drifting believers. They were written to challenge people who are drifting. And so what we read this morning in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be, what? Teachers, right? So though he's writing to the Hebrews there. He says, you need someone to do what? Teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. So now do you see there are some basic principles of the word of God that it needs to be believed? Do you see in that passage when he, he's talking about, he says, basically, you need to have learned these things. The word oracle means word of God, basically. When you hear oracle of God, it just means God's word, God's spoken word. And these are some of the basic principles of the word of God. And if you're drifting, it may be that these basic principles, these oracles, these elementary doctrines that it talks about here need to be more clearly, fully developed into your life. That's why chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, let us leave, these, leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instructions about washings and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal life. Now, that's a huge sentence. And it's very strange because the writer of Hebrews says, what? Let us leave what? the elementary doctrines of Christ. What does that mean to you? What does that mean? What does it mean to leave the elementary doctrines of Christ? Well, I think it means, it's see, the word elementary doctrine of Christ is the beginning of the word of God, or you could put it this way. The elementary doctrines are, are the road that leads to Christ. It's the road that leads to Christ. The entire argument of the, of the Hebrews letter, or the letter to the Hebrews, is that Jesus is the final word. Stated right in ver chapter 1, verse 1, he is the final word and he is better. He's a better. Remember, he's writing to Hebrews in Hebrews, right? Doesn't that make sense? He's writing to a Hebrew population and trying to help them understand how the Old Testament is fulfilled by the New. How Jesus is the fulfillment of all the scripture. And he's trying to help them understand that. And Jesus, there were a lot of things that people looked at in the Old Testament to hear the voice of God. They looked at prophets. They looked at dreams, experiences. They would look at sacrifices. They would look at ceremonies. But when Jesus came to the world, the final word was spoken in Jesus Christ. He is the final word. He is God's final and complete revelation of himself. And so, by definition, no one can move beyond Jesus Christ. Okay? No one can move beyond Jesus Christ. So when the writer of Hebrews said, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ, he is certainly not saying that Christians can move on from Jesus. That's not what he's saying. Do you, do you understand that? He's not moving on. He says, know the elementary doctrines of Christ is the starting point for faith in Jesus Christ and that is we need a clear grasp of why we need Jesus in order to come to him every person here knows that professes faith in Christ knows that they have had a clear experience or clear understanding that you need Jesus or I need Jesus right I mean if you get anything out of this sermon let me just say you need Jesus I need Jesus. We all need Jesus. But what we, need, what we need to do is when you have a clear grasp of why you need him, 
and that you've got that road that leads to Christ, the very beginning, the most basic principles of all, why you need Christ, then your faith will become settled and it'll be a faith that lasts because you know you need him. You don't try Jesus, you need Jesus. So we're talking today about things that are absolutely foundational to the faith. We're talking about what will lead you to Christ. What will lead you to to Christ Jesus. Now, Now God has made clear in the Old Testament why we need Jesus. Long before Jesus was ever born into the world. And so what is described in And these difficult verses, beginning in Hebrews chapter 6, is not a New Testament revelation of Jesus. It's an Old Testament anticipation of Jesus. He's writing to Hebrews to say, listen, here, here is the way you should have understood the road to Christ. Why Christ is the starting point and the final destination of where you're going. This is what you need to know. And when it talks about the elementary doctrines of Christ... Or the basic principles, it's talking about the same thing. It's talking about that elementary road that leads to Christ. It's not a summary of the entire Christian faith. It's a clear explanation, though, of why they need Jesus. And they get that from the Old Testament scriptures. And Hebrews describes these basic truths, the basic doctrines of truth, the principles of God's word as what? Milk, right? Milk. Now, I don't know what you, I love milk. I mean, I mean, we used to drink a lot of it when I was, I don't drink as much as I used to. My family used to drink, we had three milk drinkers, we drank 12 gallons a week. So we drank a lot of milk growing up. In fact, I would drink it every morning. I would, I would get out of, you know, one of those mixing bowls. I would pour Wheaties, uh, half a box of Wheaties into a mixing bowl some sugar, and then about half a gallon of milk. And that was my breakfast every day before I went to school. And then I would come home from school, I would have more milk and a snack, and at, at, at dinner time, I was limited to three glasses of milk. My, da- my dad drank milk, my sister drank milk, my mom didn't drink milk. But milk was an important part of our life. But what he's using milk is, is, a, is a metaphor for what is What is basic? What is the road to Christ? Chapter 5, verse 12 says, Every Christian needs the milk of why we need Jesus. And then we must go on from the milk of why we need Jesus to the meat of who Jesus is and what he did. But first, before you think about who he is and what he did, you need to understand why do you need Jesus? Because before you get to the meat, you've got to take the milk. And the burden of my heart today is that my experience is that there are many who are in the church, who are brought up in the church world, who are not clear about why they need Jesus. And so you, then you end up looking at faith in sort of a depersonalized way and assessing whether it's for you or whether it's not for you. And then you end up drifting, though, and your faith tends to not be at lasting. It's not built to last. And so today, you'll come to faith, let me just say that you will come to faith in Jesus Christ when you see your need of him. And your faith in Jesus will last because it'll be solidified on that desperate need you have for him. Now, there are three reasons. These are going to be quick this morning. There are three reasons you need Jesus, taken right out of chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. First of all, you need Jesus Because your best efforts are dead works. Let me repeat that. You need Jesus this morning because your best efforts are dead works. In other words, what I am saying is that you cannot win favor with God. Your works will never win you any points or favor with God. Your best efforts, your greatest efforts, your greatest works are dead. You got that? Does it make sense? Notice what he says in verse 1. He says, after he says, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, he says, not laying a foundation of repentance from the dead, of dead works, and faith towards God. Now, repentance means what? What does repentance mean? Think about it. 
Repentance means turning what? Away, right? Turning away from something and turning away specifically in this verse from what? Dead works. So now understand what dead works are. Dead works are the very best you can offer God. So we will have in our hearts and in our minds a great passion about making the world a better place. And that's a good thing. It's absolutely wonderful to do that. But if you think that you can offer to God what you do, the good you do into the, in this world, and that you can offer this to God, and that somehow this good that you do in this world will win favor with God, that is a deadly mistake. Our best works are dead works in this way. They cannot win favor with God. Please don't drift through your life assuming that because you're a basically, quote, good person, that when you get to the end of your life, you will, you will, everything will be okay. For you cannot trust in your dead works to stand before God at all, can you? The Bible is telling you, here's, what you, here's why you need Jesus. Your best works will be dead on arrival in the presence of God. So now, how do you get to God? Well, not based upon your goodness, right? Not how good you are, but based upon what Jesus did for you. What he's done. See, the world is telling you all the time that you're a good person. The world is telling every oh, you're a good person, you're a good person, you're good. Stop telling you yourself that you're a good person. Because what is the most basic principle in the Word of God is the fa- what is foundational as long as you last here on earth that your heart really isn't good. It's not that good. It's not basically good. So you've got to turn from that idea that what you do in this life is going to earn favor because your heart has goodness in it to the idea that realize that you have rebelled from God and that your heart really is in a rebellious state and that path to Jesus is going to be the only path you can take to reconcile that relationship that you have torn apart. You see, what it says here is you need to turn towards faith in God. See, what does it say? It says... We, 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 we should not lay again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Now, what did you do when you came to Christ? You repented of what? Dead works or your own ability to earn favor with God, right? And then you had faith in God, right? You, 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 you quit having faith in yourself and you transferred your trust from yourself to God. You know, I used to use an illustration of chairs. Remember the chair illustration? Some of you may know the chair. I could use a pew illustration. I could say, I believe that pew will hold me up. What do I have to do to prove to you they would hold me up? What I, someone said, I'd have to sit on it, right? I would have to actually sit in that pew to prove to you that I believe that it would hold me up. Right now, I'm trusting this platform to hold me up. Or I could sit in the pew over here. I would have to transfer my trust if I was sitting over there from that pew to this pew. And that's what we do when we come to faith in Christ. We, we transfer our trust that all our life we've been trusting in our own self and our own goodness to get us into heaven. When we, all we need to do, because that's never going to work, because that didn't, God doesn't look at it that way because of our sin, But what we need to do is transfer to see what Jesus did upon that cross, what Jesus did for us so that we could be in right relationship with God. And so here's my question. It's a very basic principle. Is this principle settled in your life? Do you realize that your best efforts are dead? Your best efforts are still dead works. Have you really come to the place And are you at the place now that you've come to really see that you're a sinner? Have you come to see that you're really a sinner? And my only hope is not what I want to do for God. My only hope lies in what he's done for me. Will you lay that foundation in your life? Number two. See, you need Jesus, not because your best efforts are dead works. You need Jesus 
because your sins will fail you and exclude you from the presence of God. I get this from chapter 6, verse 2, which says that we need to what? Repent or not lay again what? Instructions about washings and the laying on of hands. Again, the key to understanding these verses is to go back in the Old Testament and ask yourself, what does washings refer to? What do they refer to? In the Old Testament, there was what? Ritual what? Washings, weren't they? The Old Testament believers would have ritual washings that would be very familiar. If you were Jewish, if you're Hebrew, you would know what those were because those washings consisted to remind people of their sin and how their sin defiled them. And they could not therefore come into the presence of God unless they were washed, cleansed in some way. Now God says in, of this in heaven, nothing unclean will ever enter it in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. Nothing unclean will enter into heaven. So when we get to heaven, we have to be washed or cleaned in some way. But that's part of the road to Jesus. You have to realize you need to be cleaned. You need to be washed. And the only way we can be washed is in the blood of Jesus Christ, right? The only way we can be washed clean and white as snow is in the blood of Christ and what he's done and accomplished in the forgiving of our sins upon the cross. And that means that no gossip, no greed, no pride, no laziness, no jealousy will ever enter into the presence of God ever, ever, ever in heaven. You see, Jesus realized that those sacrifices in the Old Testament were kind of washings, weren't they? They were, they were kind of washings. And then he says, the laying on of hands. What does that refer to in the Old Testament? Do you remember the Day of Atonement? You remember what happened that for a Jewish believer on the Day of Atonement, they, they brought to the high priest uh, maybe a, a goat, and, and, and the high priest would do what? The high priest would lay his hand upon the goat and confess all the sins of the people of Israel, that, right? And this is found in, in Leviticus chapter 16. And then he would send the goat what? Away. Symbolizing, guess, guess what? That they have been, they have laid on hands and that sin that, that, that prevented you from having the relation with God is sent away into the wilderness. And so now this transfer of guilt into the head of the animal, of course, is pointing forward to what happens when Jesus, what? Took our sins upon him on the cross and our guilt is now sent away, isn't it? Just like that goat that goes out of the camp, our sin has gone. And here's why we need Jesus. It's to lay a foundation. Because our sin and our failure need to be cleansed. And it would be impossible for you to ever enter into the presence of a holy God without that cleansing. Without that atonement. And the basic principle of the word of God has to be settled in your mind. If you, if you believe you need Jesus because, guess what, you need to be cleansed. And you always need to be cleansed. There is not one person that is better than another person. We can't look at one person. In our society, that's one of the problems I see, that some people think they're better than others. Some people that think they're more, more holy than others. Some people think they're, they're, they're closer to God. Let me tell you, the only thing that that matters to God is his son Jesus Christ and what he did. When we really think about it, you need Jesus. And finally, you need Jesus because life is eternal. Life is eternal. One day you will face the judgment of God. And it says in verse 6, chapter 2, at the end it says, don't lay again the resurrection of the dead, instructions about the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. What he's talking about there to a Hebrew is that everybody's going to be ri ri risen again, and we're all going to have to stand before God. The road that leads to Christ is a road that realizes that our life will not end in this life. Life doesn't end. We will still be alive. We'll still have existence after we are gone from this place. And if you believe 
that your life will never end. It will also give you more of a stability to realize your faith will last. Yes, you will die. But when that day comes, whenever it is for you, the door will be opened. You will pass immediately into the conscious presence of presence of Almighty God, and the ultimate reality is that all of us, young and old, have to deal with that because it is appointed, God says, for a person to die once, and then after that comes the judgment. In other words, we don't go around and around again. We stand before God, and we will be held accountable. We'll be held accountable before the, in the presence of God. We'll be held accountable for everything we've done, every thought we've thought every thought we did, every word that we said, and everything that we have done. And if we stand before God and we are basing it on our thoughts and our deeds and our our words, we'll never make it because remember we said at the beginning, all our good deeds are what? Dead works. But it doesn't need to be that way for you. It doesn't need to be that way for any of us. Because if you are here today and you are listening to this, if you will have Christ, If you will fall upon Christ today, if you will affirm Christ as your Savior and Lord, he will stand by you and with you on the day of judgment, and he will say, she is mine. He is mine. He will say that over and over again when we stand before God, and God looks at our lives, and he will say, he's mine. She's mine. I died for her sins. I died so that... He could have justice and be in your presence, Father. And that's the foundation of our lives. You need Jesus because this life is not your end. You need Jesus today because he's your only hope. And when this foundation is settled in your mind, you will come to faith in Christ. When you really think you need Jesus, you will come to faith. You'll come to faith and your faith will be one that lasts. So my prayer for all of us today and those who are praying over this very simple truth is that your faith will last because you know you need Jesus. That's what Paul's trying to tell the the Hebrews because what did the Hebrews think? What did the Jews think? They they didn't think they needed Jesus. Many of them didn't think that he, he, he was... They had a covenant of their own. But what did, what did the writer of Hebrews says? Here, the new covenant, Jesus' covenant is better. Well, we have priests. He says, listen, everybody's a priest. He believed in the priesthood of all believers, didn't he? That we can go to God and we can, we can confess our sins to God in a personal relationship that we have with him. And if, if this is not settled before you today, If it's not settled, maybe you'll look back and say, maybe today is the day that I'll settle this. These elementary principles, this this person of drifting didn't know that he needed Jesus. And if you drift, maybe you need Jesus. Maybe you need to know that. And I'd encourage you to do that and come to him and settle your faith today. Settle it on him and not something else. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for Jesus. I'm thankful so much for all that you have given to us and with us. I pray today, Father, that as we look to Jesus, as we look to him, as we look to your word, Father, that we want not only milk, but we want meat. Father, today we want to not leave Jesus, for there is no way to leave Jesus. But Father, the elementary we got to Jesus. We need to continue to grow. Over the next weeks, Father, I pray that we would learn how we can grow. But before we learn how to grow in our relationship with you, Father, we need to settle once and for all.